Okay, so now that we've looked at a few examples of what type of sampling method we've been using, um, I just want to mention that true random sampling is done with replacement. However, for practical reasons, most sampling is done without replacement. So let me talk about these two ideas. If we were thinking about slips of paper, if I wanted to do true random sampling, every time I took a slip of paper out of that hat, I would actually throw it back in there so that I had the same sample size each time out. Um, you see this pop up on your calculator. Your calculator is sampling with replacement and that's because we, we get repeats sometimes and repeats happen if you sample with replacement. You can see it on your random digit table. Uh, sometimes we get repeats popping up there. That's because we're sampling with replacement. But in the real world, we usually just throw those repeats out or sample without replacement. Because if I've already had asked somebody to be in my experiment, I'm not gonna re-ask them, the, uh, re them to be in my experiment. I'm just gonna go ahead and sample without replacement. And there is a rule that lets us get away with this that we'll talk about more in chapter eight. So as long as we are sampling from large populations, sampling without replacement has little to no effect on our data. And you see that word large is written in quotes. We'll talk about what large means when we get to chapter eight. Well, chapters eight through 13, we'll talk about what it means to have a large sample, different rules for different types of data. Okay. Whenever we do get a sample, we ideally want a representative sample. And that means we want our sample to represent our population. because the entire idea behind statistics is just avoid running the census. We don't wanna run the census to find the parameter. We wanna take a sample and find a statistic and then generalize that to our population. So we need our sample to represent our population. It should look like your population just on a smaller scale, but so much can go wrong when you're selecting your sample and we have a word for that, it's called bias. So a sample is biased if it systematically overrepresents or underrepresents a segment of our population. Some examples of bias are selection bias, response bias, and non-response bias. Okay. So let's just give a quick example of each of these um, so we can see what on earth I'm talking about. So selection bias. Um, let's say you are, um, you're gonna take a poll of how people are feeling on the upcoming election and you get a list of cell phone numbers and you start randomly dialing those cell phone numbers you have. And you, you ask them like, hey, are you gonna vote for this person, this person, so on and so forth. If you are limiting your sample to just the folks with cell phones and you're not considering landlines, you are systematically underrepresenting the folks that only have landlines. And it's possible that the folks that only have landlines are gonna have a different opinion about the upcoming election than the folks on the cell phones. And that bias might lead to a bad statistic. All right, so selection bias. I'm gonna sneeze, hold up. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, response bias. This pops up when you have um, poorly worded questions. I'm sure you've taken a survey and you've had to fill out answers to questions and hopefully some thought went, uh, went into how those questions were worded. But you do wanna be on the lookout for poorly worded questions. So if you saw some kind of survey where one of the questions said, stupid people like the color blue, what is your favorite color? You're gonna get a lot fewer responses saying blue, even though that might be their favorite color. And, and that, that's an over-exaggerated example, but it does happen. I, I might ask you something personal or something embarrassing and you might not wanna answer it. You might change your response to it leading to bad data. If I asked you something like, have you ever cheated on a test? You might not wanna tell me the truth. You might just say no, even if the answer was yes. So if I ask you a poorly worded question, or maybe that survey is an anonymous, it might lead to a response bias. Non-response bias, 
You've probably run into this in your life, you just haven't realized it yet. Your phone rings, you pick it up, and it's some telemarketer asking you to take a survey. What do you typically do? You hang up. So that invokes a non-response bias. Are the people who are hanging up, do they have a different opinion than the folks who would actually stay on the phone and answer the question? So bias samples that are not representative of the population give results that are not accurate, or I should say that are inaccurate and not valid. All right, so they give us biased statistics. And it's important just to take note that bias is introduced in the way in which a sample is selected or by the way in which data are collected from the sample. All right, increasing the size of the sample, it's desirable for other reasons that we'll talk about in chapter eight, but increasing the size in the sample does nothing to reduce bias. So I think there's this misconception out there where folks will say, well, I have a bad sample. Okay, it's a little biased. I'll just survey some more people. Well, if your sampling method has bias in it, doing more of that bad thing won't fix the bad thing. So I don't want you to think that, oh, I'll just increase the sample size, I'm good to go. No, you gotta make sure that your system that's in place, your stratification, your SRS, your clustering, that system that's in place is getting you your representative sample. If you don't have your representative sample, then you're gonna have a bad stat. You're gonna generalize that bad stat to your population and it's not gonna work, okay? All right, so let's scoot over to example 16. Huge, intimidating looking word problem, but welcome to stats, we're gonna have lots of these. All right, so as we start to go through this, here we go. Several online textbook retailers advertise that they have lower prices than on-campus bookstores. However, an important factor is whether internet retailers actually have the textbooks that students need in stock. Students need to be able to get the textbooks promptly at the beginning of the college term. If the book is not available, then a student would not be able to get the textbook at all, or might, it might get delayed if the book is backordered. A college newspaper reported is an, excuse me, a college newspaper reporter is investigating the textbook availability at online retailers. He decides to investigate one textbook from each of the following seven subjects: calculus, bio, chem, physics, stats, geo, and general engineering. He consults the textbook industry sales data and then selects the most popular nationally used textbook in each of these subjects. He visits websites for a random sample of major online textbook sellers and looks up each of these seven textbooks to see if they are available in stock for a quick delivery through these retailers. Based on his investigation, he writes an article in which he draws conclusions about the overall availability of all college textbooks through online textbook retailers. All right, write an analysis of his study that addresses the following issues. Is his sample representative of all college textbooks? Explain why or why not. Describe some possible sources of bias and how it might, reflect, might affect the results of the study. Give some suggestions on what could be done to improve the study. All right, so you see a couple of words are underlined, right? I've got one, I've got the, the textbooks that he's, he's, or the subjects that he's taking a look at, I've got most popular, I've got all, and then I wanna just start to, to mention this. So there is a lot to unpack in this, this question, this prompt. I need to ask myself, is his sample representative of the population of all college textbooks? Then I need to explain it. Then I need to describe some possible sources of bias in the study. Then I need to figure out how that might affect the results and then give some suggestions. So there's a lot that I need written up in my answer. And you wanna make sure on your quizzes and on your midterms and your final that you address all of the questions asked of you. I get it all too often where students don't answer every question asked of them. So really just take a moment, read the question, make sure you're answering everything that I ask about. All right, so let's do this. Write an analysis of his study that addresses the following issues. Is his sample representative of the population, again, of all college textbooks? Well, let's look at his sample. He took one textbook that was a calc textbook, one bio, physics, stats, geo, gen engineering. He took one of each. So he has seven books in his sample. All right, do those seven books represent all college textbooks? No. All right, what is wrong with this? What can you see about the seven he picked? The first I see is that he only chose STEM books. There's no English books in here. There's no humanities. There's no arts, nothing like that. So he only chose STEM books.
And the reason I'd be concerned about that is because maybe STEM books are harder to get and more likely to be out of stock. Or maybe they're easier to get and, and less likely to be out of stock, but either way you slice it, these seven subjects do not represent all, all subjects. So I can't say it represents all college textbooks. The other thing I noticed is he only looked at the, the most popular one, right? He, he didn't take 10 calc books, 10 bio, 10 physics, so on and so forth. And I understand that. This, this is a reporter, he's, he's trying to get, he's got a deadline trying to get his article written, so he doesn't have time to do it. I'm not knocking him, but it does introduce a source of bias. So he only looked at one book from each subject. So if I wanted to uh, take a look at where I am, is this sample representative of all college textbooks? I answered that. I said no. Did I explain why or why not? I did. So this now says, describe some possible sources of bias in the study and how it might affect the results. So he was biased in that he was only choosing STEM books. By only choosing STEM books and not other subjects, we don't know about the overall availability of all college textbooks. So by only choosing STEM books, we gather no information on the availability of books from other subjects. And again, I, I don't know this, but perhaps STEM books are harder to find, right? So they're less available online than the other books. But I, I wouldn't know that because I don't have these other books to compare it to. So perhaps I'll scoop this up, are less likely to be available readily online. Oops. You could make the argument, if you wanted to, that they're more likely to be available online because so many students need those classes. You can make the argument either way, but I am talking about a possible source of bias and I explain how it might affect the results, right? So maybe STEM books are less likely to be uh, available ready on, readily online and that's gonna make its way into his report. I also would say there's a bias here in that he's only choosing the most popular book. Now maybe if, the, uh, if you're looking just at the most popular book because it's so popular, it's always in stock. Or you could argue the flip of that. Because it's so popular, it's harder to find it. I don't care which way you make the argument for this particular problem, but just commit to something and make the argument. So maybe I write by choosing the most popular book, or popular text, Um, he introduces yet another bias. He introduces more bias. And I'll go with this lamp. Perhaps the most popular text is more readily available because it is so popular. And again, you could make the argument the other way. Maybe it's less available because it's so popular. 
But I've talked about, again, this is now two versions or two answers to that, that part of the question. These are possible sources of bias and how it might affect the results. Okay, give some suggestions about what could be done to improve the study. So what would I suggest to him? Again, if he had more time, I would say, hey, expand your sample to include texts from other subjects and then get just more texts per subject. So if I look back through this, let me just do a quick check. I answered this question and answered this one. I did describe some possible sources of bias. I described how it might affect the results and I gave some suggestions. So I've answered all the questions asked of me. I got complete sentences, they're properly written. I'm good to go.